Hello guys, this is Immortal Love of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sclude, and let's dive 31, Hela Goddess of Death. The day after I got home from a marathon visit, a man De Deborah didn't know called her asking if she would ride on a Hela float in a black rodeo. He told her to be careful if people were looking to find out where Henrietta's grave was, because they might want to steal her bones, since her body was so valuable to science. Deborah told the men she'd been talking to me for a book, and he warned her not to talk to white people about her story. She panicked and called her brother Lawrence, who told her the man was right. So she left me a message saying she couldn't talk to me anymore. But by the time I got the message and called her back, she had changed her mind. Everybody always yelling, racism, racism. The white man stole that black woman's cells. The white man killed that black woman. That's crazy talk, she told me. We all black and white and everything else. This is if it's a race thing. There's two sides to the story. And that's what we want to bring out. Nothing about my mother is the truth if it's about wanting to free, to fry the researchers. It's not about punishing doctors or landing the hospital. I don't want that. Deborah and I grew on like this for a full year. Each time I visited, we would walk Baltimore Harbor, ride boats, Boats read science books together and talked about her mother's cells. We took David and Alfred to the Maryland Science Center, where they saw a 20-foot wall covered floor to the ceiling with a picture of cells staying new and green and magnified under a microscope. They even grabbed my hand and pulled me towards the wall of cells, yelling, Miss Rebecca! Miss Rebecca! Is that great Grandma Henrietta? People nearby stared as I said, actually, they might be. And David pranced around singing, Grandma Henrietta famous, Grandma Henrietta famous. At one point, as Deborah and I walked along the cobblestone streets of Fells Point late at night, she turned to me and without prompting said, I'll bring the medical records out on my terms and when I think it's right. She told me that the night she tackled her mother's medical records and ran home, she thought I was trying to steal them. She said, I just need somebody I can trust. So that better will talk to me and don't keep me in the dark. She asked me to promise I wouldn't hide anything from her. I promised I wouldn't. Between trips, Deborah and I would spend hours each week talking over the phone. Occasionally, someone would convince her her couldn't trust a white person to tell her mother's story. And she would call me in a panic, demanding to know whether Hopkins was paying me to get information from her like people said. Other times, she would get suspicious about money, like when a genetics textbook publisher called offering her $300 for permission to print the photo of Henrietta. When Deborah said that uh, they had to give her 25000 they said no. She called them demanding to know who was paying me to write my book and how much I was going to give her. Each time, I told her the same thing. I hadn't sold the book yet. So at that point, I was paying for my research with my student loans and credit cards. And regardless, I couldn't pay her for her story. Instead, I said, if the book ever got published, I would set up a scholarship fund for descendants of Henrietta Lacks. On Deborah's good days, she was excited about this idea. Education is everything, she'd say. If I had more of it, maybe this whole thing about my mother wouldn't have been so hard. That's why I'm all standing them. Keep on studying, learning all you can. But on bad days, she would think I was lying and cut off me again. Those moments never lasted long, and they always ended with Deborah asking me to promise yet again that I would never hide anything from her. Eventually, I told her she could even come with me when I did some of my research if she wanted, and she said, I want to go to the centers and colleges and all that, learning places. And I want to get the medical record and autopsy report on my system. I began sending her stacks of information that I uncovered about her mother, scientific journal articles, photos of her cells, even an occasional novel, poem, or short story based on Gila. In one, a mad scientist used Gila as a biological weapon to spread rabies. Another featured yellow house paint made of Gila cells that could talk. I sent Deborah news as exhibits where several artists projected Henrietta's cells on walls, and one displayed a heart-shaped culture she'd grown by fusing her own cells with Gila. With each packet, I sent notes explaining what each thing meant, clearly labeling what was fiction and what wasn't, 
and warning her about anything that might upset her. Each time Deborah got a package, she would call to she would call to talk about what she read, and gradually her panicked calls grew less frequent. Soon, after she realized I was the same age as her daughter, she started calling me Boo, and insisted I buy a cell phone because she worried about me driving the interstates alone. Each time I talked to her brothers, she'd yell at them, only half joking, saying, "Don't you try to take my reporter." Go get your own. When we met for a first trip, Deborah got out of her car wearing a black ankle-length skirt, black sandals with heels, and a black shirt covered with an open black cardigan. After we hugged, she said, "I got all my reporter clothes." She put in a black button-up shirt, black pants, and a black boot set. Oh, she pointed at mine. You always wear black. So I figure I should dress like you, so I blend in. For each trip, Deborah filled her jeep floor to ceiling with every kind of shoes and clothes she might need. You never know when the weather's gonna change. She brought pillows and blankets in case we got stranded somewhere, and oscillating fan in case she got hot. Plus her hair cutting and manicure equipment from beauty school. Boxes of videotapes, music CDs, office supplies, and every document she had related to Henrietta. We always stuck to cars because Deborah didn't trust me enough to ride with me yet. I would follow behind, watching her black driving cab bop up and down to her music. Sometimes, when we ran the curbs or stopped at lights, I could hear her belting out "Born to Be Wild" or her favorite William Bell song "I Forgot to Be Your Lover." Eventually, Deborah let me come to her house. It was dark, with thick closed curtains, black couches, dim lights, and deep brown wood-panelled walls lined with religious scenes on black light posters. We spent all of our time in her office, where she slept most nights instead of the bedroom she shared with Pullum. We fought a lot, she told me, and needed some space. Her room was about six feet wide, with a twin bed, one wall, and a small desk directly across from it. Nearly touching the bed, on top of the desk, stacked beneath reams of paper, boxes and envelopes, letters and bills, was her mother's Bible. Its pages warped, cracking with age and spotted with mold. Her mother's and sister's hairs still tucked inside. Deborah's walls were covered in floor to ceiling with colorful photos of bears, horses, dogs, and cats she torn from. She had torn from calendars, as well as a nearly a dozen. Bright felt squares she and David had made by hand. One was a yellow "Thank you, Jesus, for loving me," written in big letters. Another said "Prophecies fulfilled," and was covered with coins made of tin foil. A shelf at the head of her bed was crammed with videotapes of infill commercials for a jacuzzi, an RV, a trip to Disneyland. Nearly every night, Deborah would say, "Hey, Damon." You want to go on vacation? When he nodded, she'd ask, "Where you want to go? Disneyland spa or RV trip?" They watched each tape many times. At the end of the one visit, I showed Deborah how to get online with a note computer someone had given her years earlier, then taught her to use Google. Soon, she started taking Ambien on her chronic sleep aid and sitting up nights in a drugged haze, listening to William Bell on headphones. Googling Henrietta and Hila, Davon referred to Deborah's Ambien as "dummy medicine" because it made her wander in the house in the middle of the night like a zombie, what, talking nonsense and trying to cook breakfast by chopping cereal with a butter knife. When he stayed with her, Davon often woke up in the middle of the night to find Deborah sleeping at her computer, head down and hands on the keyboard. He just pushed her off the chair into the bed and tucked her in. When David wasn't there, Deborah often woke up with her face on the desk, surrounded by a mountain of pages that spilled from her printer onto the floor. Scientific articles, patent applications, random newspapers, articles, and blog posts, including many of that had no connection to her mother, but used the words Henrietta or Lax or Hila. And surprisingly, there were many of the ma- of the latter. Hila is a native name for the country of Sri Lanka. Where activists carry signs demanding justice for the Hela nation, 
is the name of a defunct German tractor company and an award-winning Shih Tzu dog. It's a seaside resort in Poland, an advertising firm in Switzerland, a Danish boat where people gather to drink vodka and watch films, and a Marvel comic book character who appears in several online games, a seven-foot-tall, half-black, half-white goddess, who's part dead and part alive, with immeasurable intelligence, superhuman strength, godlike stamina and durability, and 500 pounds of solid muscle. She is responsible for plague, sicknesses, and catastrophes. She is immune to fire, radiation, toxins, corrosive disease, and aging. She can also levitate and control people's minds. When Deborah found pages describing Hela, the Marvel character, she thought they were describing her mother, since each of Hela's street in some way matched what Deborah had heard about her mother's selves. But it turned out that the sci-fi Hela was inspired by an ancient Norse goddess of death who lives trapped in the land between hell and the living. Deborah figured that goddess was based on her mother, too. One day, around three o'clock in the morning, my phone rang as, as I slept, feverish with flu. Deborah yelled, on the other hand, I told you, London clone my mother. Her voice was slow and slurred from ambient. She'd googled, Healer, clone, London, and DNA, and gotten thousands of hits with summaries like this from an online chat room discussion about Healer cells. Each contains a genetic blueprint from constructing Henrietta Lux. Can we clone her? Her mother's name showed up under headlines like cloning and human farming, and she thought those thousands of hits were proof that scientists had cloned thousands of Henriettas. They didn't clone her, I said. They just made copied of her cells, I promise. Thanks, boo. I'm sorry I woke you, she cooed. But if they clone her cells, does that mean something that could clone my mother? No, I said. Good night. After several weeks of finding Deborah unconscious with her phone in her hand or face on the keyboard, Devon told his mother he needed to stay at his grandmother's house at all times to take care of her after she took her medicine. Deborah took an average of 14 pills a day, which cost her about $150 each month after her husband's insurance, plus Medicaid and Medicare. I think it's 11 prescriptions, she told me once. Maybe 12. I can't keep track. They change all the time. One for acid reflux went from $8 one month to $135 the next. So she stopped taking it. And at one point, her husband's insurance canceled her prescription coverage. So she started cutting her pills in half to make them last. When Ambien ran out, she stopped sleeping until she got more. She told me her doctors started prescribing her drugs in 1997 after what she referred as the gold digger situation, which she refused to tell me about. That was when she applied for social security disability, she said, which she only got after several court appearances. Social security people said everything was in my head, she told me. They ended up sending me about to five psychiatrists and a bunch of doctors. They say I'm paranoid, I'm schizophrenia, I'm nervous, I got anxiety, depression, degenerating kneecaps, bursitis, bulged disc in my back, diabetes, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, cholesterol. I don't know all that was wrong with me by name, she said. I don't know if anyone do. All I know is when I get in that mood, I get friend and I hide. That's what happened the first time I called, she said. I was all excited, say I want a book written by my mother. Then things just got, just got starting in my head and I got scared. I know my life could be better than I wish it was, she told me. When people hear about my mother cells, they always say, oh, y'all could be rich. Y'all gotta sue Hopkins, y'all gotta do this and that. But I don't want that. She laughed. Truth be told, I can't get mad at science because it helps people live. And I'll be a mess without it. I'm a walking drugstore. I can't say nothing about bad science, but I won't lie. I would like some health insurance so I don't go to I don't gotta pay all that money every month for drugs my mother sells properly helped to make. Eventually, as they grew comfortable with the internet, she started using it more, then terrifying herself in the middle of the night. 
She made lists of questions from me and printed articles about research done on people without her knowledge or consent, from a vaccine trial in Uganda to the testing drugs on U.S. troops. She started organizing information to carefully labeled folders, one about cells, another about cancer, another full of definitions of legal terms like statute of limitations and patient confidentiality. At one point, she stumbled on an article called What's Left of Henrietta Lacks? That infuriated her by saying Henrietta had probably gotten HPV because she slept around. Then people don't know enough about science, she told me. Just having HPV don't mean my mother was loose. Most people got it. I read about it on the internet. Then, in April 2001, nearly a year after we met, Deborah called to tell me that the president of Cancer Club had called wanting to put her on stage of an event honoring her mother. She was horrified. Oh, she was worried, she said, and she wanted to meet to find out if he was legit. He turned out to be Franklin Salisbury Jr., president of the National Foundation for Cancer Research. He decided to hold the Foundation's 2001 conference in Henrietta's honor. On September 13th, 70, 70 top cancer researchers from around the world would gather to present their research, he said, and hundreds of people would attend, including the mayor of Washington, D.C., and the Surgeon General. He hoped Deborah would speak there and accept a plaque in her mother's honor. I understand that the family feels very abused, he told me. We can't get the money, but I'm hoping this conference will set the historic record straight and help me make help make them feel better, even if we are 50 years late. When I explained this to Deborah, she was ecstatic. It would be just like Patillo's conference in Atlanta, she said, only bigger. She immediately started planning what she would wear and asking questions about what the research would be talking about. And she worried again about whether she would be safe on stage, whether she, there would be a sniper waiting for her. What if they think I'm going to cause trouble about them taking the cells or something? I don't think you need to worry about that, I said. The scientist is excited to meet you. Besides, I told her, it was going to be in a federal building with high security. Okay, she said, but first I want to go to see my mother's cells so I know what everybody's talking about at the conference. When we hung up, I went to call Christopher Longhour, the cancer researcher had given Deborah to paint a chromosome picture, but before I could dig out his number, my phone rang again. It was Deborah crying. I thought she was panicking, changing her mind about seeing the cells, but instead she wailed. Oh, my baby, Lord help me, they got him with fingerprints on a pizza box. Her son Alfred had a friend who had been in a crime spree, robbing at least five liquor stores at gunpoint. Security cameras caught Alfred on tape, yelling at a store clerk and waving a bottle of wild Irish rose above his head. He'd stolen a 12-ounce bottle of beer, one bottle of wild Irish rose, two packs of new port cigarettes, and about a hundred dollars in cash. The police arrested him in front of his house and threw him in a car, while his son, Little Alfred watched from the lawn. I still want to go see themselves, Deborah said, sobbing. I ain't going to let this stop me from learning about my mother and sister. And this is the end of chapter 31.